This is The Red Line, where we talk to three expert witnesses about one issue shaping the news both here and overseas. 2019 has been one of the most tumultuous years in recent history, with political divisions, wars, elections, revolutions, and with increasing power to authoritarian regimes across the world. We also see dark clouds starting to appear on the horizon for what could be a nasty 2020. Rather than our usual deep dive episode, we thought we would do a predictions for 2020 piece, with three expert witnesses giving their predictions for what will be the biggest stories to change our world in 2020. But for now, let's talk about 2019. In January, Jair Bolsonaro took office and brought in the most authoritarian government since the military dictatorship in Brazil. Venezuela began huge protests that raged to this day and the country continues to fall deeper and deeper into the crisis. February saw Trump withdraw from the Intermediate Nuclear Missile Treaty, Macedonia renaming itself, and Pakistan shooting down an Indian plane in one of the most volatile conflict zones on the planet. In March, we saw the arrest of Cardinal George Pell, a resignation of the President of Kazakhstan after 29 years at the helm, the last of ISIS's physical land being retaken, and tensions escalating again in the Strait of Taiwan. April saw the arrest of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. We also saw elections in India, Indonesia, Israel and Spain that all had dire consequences for the country's path going forward. We also saw a comedian win the presidency of Ukraine as they continue their war in the east with Russia. And Notre Dame almost burnt to the ground. On top of that, there was an attempted coup by the US in the country of Venezuela. In May, there were large crackdowns in Gaza, tensions with Iran, and the US began to escalate quickly for what it looked like might be an entire full-scale invasion of Iran. We also saw the re-election of right-wing presidents in the Philippines, India, and Australia, and the recognition of a right-wing president in the UK, Theresa May. June saw a revolution in Sudan, and the beginnings of another one in Hong Kong, both of which are not yet solidified. July saw a record average temperature in the Northern Hemisphere and two British tankers being captured by Iranian forces in the Persian Gulf, once again escalating what was already a tense situation. In August, huge protests swept across West Papua and the Indonesian crackdown against them was swift and severe. Fires burned through the Amazon and the US economy started to show the first signs of an upcoming financial crisis. September was a month of increasing tension, with the US deploying even more troops to the Middle East, and impeachment proceedings beginning against the president back home. Saudi Arabian facilities were attacked with Yemeni drones, and insurrection escalated in Afghanistan around the national elections. In October, Iraq began a national uprising against their government. Catalonia pushed for independence, and Canada saw the re-election of Justin Trudeau. We also saw the first protesters in Hong Kong killed. It was also the month where the US betrayed their last ally in the region, the Kurdish, and gave the green light to the Turkish government to move forces into northern Syria, at the expense of thousands of Kurdish lives. It was also the beginning of this podcast, with a deep dive into the 18-year anniversary on the beginning of the war in Afghanistan, and we thank everyone who's been tuning in since then. November brought flooding to Venice, formal charges against the Prime Minister of Israel, and protests beginning in Chile and Bolivia, with Bolivia going on to remove their president in a dubious coup. December saw an election in the UK and formal impeachment proceedings beginning against the president of the United States, as well as a slew of scandals for the government in Australia. It has been a tumultuous year. Next year is likely to be even more toxic. With an upcoming US presidential election and protests all around the globe, This will be a big year for humanity. So, let's talk to our first expert witness on what he thinks is likely to pop up in 2020. Part 1. The Unstoppable Force and the Immovable Object So it's kind of odd. I spend all my time nowadays writing quite narrowly about British politics. In the past, I've done things on Australian politics. And it's not like I claim a great expertise on either China or America, but it just seems so blindingly obvious that a lot is going to hinge upon that relationship and that the next year is going to be a big year in that relationship. Andrew Heinmoor, 
is a professor of politics and international Part relations one. at the University oh, of Sheffield. God, it sounds so tired. He also lectures at the London ah. School of Economics and is the editor of the Journal of Political Studies. He joins us today. If those cracks widen, if Trump's re-elected, if China moves on Hong Kong, then that would feel like a pretty epoch-defining moment. So let's stay on China here. What do you think the biggest story for China will be in 2020? So they're going through a new national planning process, but it's, it seems to me that looking at it from outside, that they're having a pretty important debate, not simply about how they want to connect to the outside world and the relationship with America, but about whether and to what extent they can afford to loosen the grip of the state in terms of tolerating even the lowest levels of dissent and civil society. I think China's got the choice between those models. I understand it. There's a kind of fair bit of a power struggle going on within China at the moment. And I think part of that is bound up with that notion with arguments about corruption. Part of it's bound up with notions of whether it can continue economic growth and and the environmental consequences of it at the same level. But it's the nature of the state above all. America matters in that relationship because if it pulls the rug out from under China in terms of trade, if America signals that it's keen to end that kind of economic relationship, then I think that on top of the internal debate is going to be a very, very tough thing for the, for the, for the, for the world in the year ahead. This year, China has invested huge amounts of money into its military projects and has been expanding its bases into a number of overseas countries. Do you think we'll continue seeing Chinese military expansion over the course of this year? I kind of think you've got to distinguish between forces that are ready for potential external engagement and forces that are primarily there for internal security but that degree of expansion is there and it's palpable and I think already that's leading to rethinking so you know take the great symbol of America's post-war military power the carrier fleets you know the capacity to sail carriers quite close to the Chinese to through the Taiwan Strait is an assertion of sovereignty those kind of days are being challenged already so in terms of China's capacity for for um, air-based missile launchers or ground-based missile launchers in huge numbers makes the carrier fleets really vulnerable. And so in any kind of future conflict, it seems to me that the carriers have got to be a lot further away from the coast than they were before. It doesn't mean they're redundant, but that great symbol of American military prowess just doesn't feel as unquestioned as it did just a few years ago. And that's, that strikes me as being quite a significant thing in terms of the military balance. Well, staying on the US and China, What do you think the future for the US-China trade war will be in 2020? I think there's a lot happening behind the scenes right now. I think the decision has been made in China that they want to try and resolve some of the trade issues. I don't know from the American side what kind of concessions they're prepared to make. It feels like if it was going, it feels like we're in a we're in a moment of calmness. I think the way I think the way in which the trade deals are getting linked to Hong Kong in the internal politics of Hong Kong is a really uh, is an important thing and potentially quite worrying. But my sense is that there are both sides are making an effort on the trade side. That there's not a kind of ratcheting up in terms of an acceptance of protectionism. Whether they can pull off a deal, I don't know at the moment. What about the big issue in China, Hong Kong? Where do you see that going in 2020? I guess the key issue, which it's really hard to tell, is is to what degree when the protests in late November became more violent, when the protesters occupied the university campuses and there was the standoff with the police, it was really hard to judge from outside to what degree the protesters were losing the broader support that they had within Hong Kong. And it's also harder to judge whether the elections at the um, late November, early December will have taken some of the sting out of the protest movement. And it's slightly unclear, I guess, at what point China might move and think that actually having a replacement chief executive for Hong Kong is a wise political move. I don't think that one feels to me like it's inevitable that it's going to go either way at the moment. It's a tough one to call at the moment. So let's turn back over to Europe now, where France will be holding its 2020 municipal elections. What do you think next year will hold Macron and his government? France is a really interesting case study at the moment in that the disposition that seems to be there in so many Western democracies to develop a really rapid and quite intense of dislike whoever's in power 
just seems to have gone further in France than it's gone almost anywhere. I mean, Macron, when you go across, just appears like a political lame duck already. I mean, he's, he's had to chop and change on his agenda. I think the, the attempt to project French force abroad has kind of given him some kind of standing. But, you know, looking at it, that domestic reform agenda that he came with just largely appears to have disappeared. So France is interesting to me because it just raises big questions about governability in Western and apparently prosperous, liberal, successful democracies. So let's go over the border now and talk about Germany. Uh, Angela Merkel's CDU, Christian Democratic Party, has been seeing losses uh, in a number of key states. Do you think this is a bad sign for the party coming up next year? Look, I think Merkel's going to last just because as she, as she gets towards her own end game, then, the, then I, I find it's going to be difficult for anyone to kind of remove her at that point. The, the big story there is around the Social Democrat Party, which is just now going through what increasingly looks like a, a death knell, where to try, where it's struggling to find the right kind of leadership, but more importantly, struggling in a country that would just appear ready-made for a social democratic message. After all, the economy is still prospering, which is one of the conditions for Social Democrat parties doing well. But it's really struggling to get any kind of traction at all. So the CDU. By and large, when you look at the numbers from outside, it's kind of staffing, its support levels are kind of broadly holding up. But that fragmentation of anything beyond the CDU, so from the Social Democrats through to the hard left, but also including the Greens and a myriad of smaller parties now, just appears that that's just in a constant state of flux. I find it really interesting. There's a sense in which if the Germ- if they, if Social Democrats can't get their act together in Germany, where are they going to be able to get their act together? And that's a big shift going back over the last 10 years now, the eclipse of social democratic parties across vast waves of Europe. Trump was highly antagonistic towards fellow NATO members at the summit in December. Do you think that could be the start of something far worse for the alliance in 2020? I kind of sense that, you know, NATO's got problems. It's got problems because its kind of original purpose of existence isn't as clear, and it's got problems because the growth in the membership of NATO, which is testimony to its success, actually weakens NATO. So obviously the thing that he could do is he could stop talking about threatening to pull America out if Western countries don't spend more on defence and actually just pull America out. Geez, that would be a huge thing if it happened, and it's not like Trump doesn't do unexpected things, Staying in Europe, Poland has an election coming up this year as well, with the incumbent Law and Justice Party tipped to win another term. Uh, They have been introducing a huge amount of anti-democratic laws uh, that go against the EU Charter. Do you think the EU may crack down this year on Poland's flaunting of the rules? Yeah, my understanding is that they are, that they're going great guns, that their level of, of support is both pretty deep and pretty broad. And I kind of think the key issue there is at what point any country within the European Union is going to act in a way that the European Union as a collective entity is going to bring that country's membership or at least the possibility of its membership into doubt and start calling countries upon the things that they're doing internally. I mean, a lot of the conditions for entry presupposed um, liberal institutions and the rule of law and so far, this is the dog that just has never barked. It just seems to me quite surprising how reluctant European institutions have been to call out what's happening in some countries. Now, that could be Hungary that's the eventual flashpoint as those countries drift into a nasty forms of right-wing populism. Then sooner or later, someone's going to have to make a call in Europe about them. And I see that as a really interesting political tension when it arises. We also saw planes being shot down this year over the India-Pakistan border region of Kashmir. Uh, Do you think we'll see further escalation in this conflict, or is this just an election stunt by India? Kashmir has just so become such an incredibly depressing story because rather like Palestine and the Middle East, it's it's just become institutionalised as a place in which there appears to be very little political progress indeed. What we've seen is India kind of Uh, bringing to an end its de facto recognition of a semi-autonomy for Kashmir and and trying to bring it fully back under the Indian thumb. Military terms, you know, my reading of 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 what's happened over the last year is that it remains the case that neither country wants to escalate the conflict 
beyond what it considers to be acceptable levels. And there's been a long history there of countries coming to the brink, skirmishes and then stepping back. You know, but every time you do that, clearly what you're doing is you're also raising the possibility that an event that you think you can control suddenly gets out of control. And in particular with Pakistan, the relationship between the politicians and the armed forces just remains so incredibly unclear um, that you're not quite sure what's going to happen. So making a prediction upon there, it doesn't seem impossible that there's going to be a skirmish. Let's turn over to America now for what is likely to be one of the biggest stories of 2020, the US presidential election. We know it's almost a guarantee that Trump will be nominated by the Republicans, but who do you think is likely to get the Democratic nomination? I have, I mean, it's a remarkable campaign, the degree to which no candidate appears to have come through and established themselves at this stage as the credible democratic challenger. I mean, that's in a sense the whole point of having these primaries is, is that you expect that winnowing to occur and a challenger to, to emerge. And then what normally happens is a bandwagon effect in which they start to rally support from different sections. They attract more donations and you get into a virtuous circle where someone who initially only gets ahead by a, by a nose and actually opens up a rather chasmous gap over their, over their rivals pretty quickly. It's really unusual that that just hasn't happened. So Warren and Biden appear to be the front runners, but it's, it just doesn't seem that you could make a prediction at the moment about, about whether it's going to be one of them or someone else will come through. So I guess it's, it's going to take a few of the actual primaries themselves before there's any degree of momentum whatsoever. So right now, the front runner for the Democrats is Joe Biden. Uh, if Biden was to be the Democratic nominee, how do you think he would fare up against Donald Trump? I think it looks, gosh, I'm hedging on a few here. I mean, everything that I've seen in polling wise is that it appears incredibly close. So the Democrats don't, I mean, they can have a better candidate with the benefit of hindsight. It looks like Hillary Clinton wasn't the right candidate the degree to which in a populist age she was seen as the embodiment of a corrupt elite. Um, I don't think the Democratic Party saw that coming. I don't think she saw it coming. And then her limitations as a campaigner, sticking pretty much in grounding her campaign upon the safe seats where she was already confident of winning, not treading into tough campaign areas. Some of the things she said about Trump's supporters I mean, she just looked like a surprisingly weak candidate as a campaigner for someone with so much experience. Biden looks like a seasoned on the ground campaigner. And it looks like at one level, he's perfectly positioned to present himself as everything that Trump is not. And at the same time to appeal to the kind of traditionally Democrat voters who abandoned the Democrats and went across to Trump. But you know, you look at some of the kind of um, soft polling around Biden, the support for him is incredibly shallow. The concerns about his age, the concerns to, to which he's about out of touch. And then frankly, already that kind of cloud that the Republicans have managed to whip up hanging over his son and allegations of corruption just mean he doesn't, you really at this stage want a dream candidate to be able to topple an incumbent president. And the Democrats just don't have one. And Trump's ratings, they wobble, they go up by a bit, they go down by a bit. But unless there's some kind of big economic catastrophe, it's his support just doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere else. And then it all comes down to rallying the vote on the day and which kind of candidates, which candidates are going to be able to do that best. And my horrible suspicion is Trump is going to be incredibly effective at getting his core vote out. And whether the Democrats can find themselves a candidate who can, both appeal to Trump voters and at the same time appeal enough to call Democratic voters to get them out in numbers. I've got this sneak, I've got a feeling that at the moment, if you're putting money on somebody, you'd be putting money on Trump. And that's never a bad idea because actually first term presidents being voted out is an unusual occurrence in America. And given that the economy is apparently going great guns on some measures, it would be pretty unusual for it to not be Trump. That feels like a, gosh, that feels like something to say out loud. But Trump's won once and I can't see, I can't see any single reason why he can't win again. 
with populist governments continuing to sweep across Europe and the Western world, this will be a year of huge pressure for institutions like the EU, NATO and the IMF. But what other problems could we be facing in 2020? Well, for that, we turn to our next guest. Part 2. Bad News from Worse Grounds uh, yeah, so I think it's the Jeffrey Epstein story purely based on how it just vanished out of the media. And this is a guy who's linked to what is basically like an elitist kind of paedophile ring that includes politicians, the royal family, celebrities, and then all of a sudden he dies and it's gone. Jake Hanrahan is a journalist and filmmaker who reports from various front lines across the globe with a focus on irregular warfare and anti-censorship stories. He's also the host of the amazing geopolitics podcast, Popular Front, and he joins us today. Like, that would have been the biggest story ever, like, had it, you know, been properly it kind of worked out. But then, you know, he, uh, he kind of <laughs> murdered himself in jail, so. You did a series of stories around the protests in Hong Kong this year. So what do you see as the future for this movement? Uh, unfortunately, I'm quite pessimistic. Like, I don't think that what they want to happen is going to happen. You know, like they're they're incredibly brave in what they're doing, and you know, it's uh, I, I kind of understand why they're doing it. You know, anti-authoritarianism. Like I get it. You know, and and also the fact that you know they have to resort to violence because the police have been so brutal on them. You know, unfortunately, that's how things go sometimes. But I don't think it's going to pan out how they want. Like. How can it? How can they win? You know, it's just, it's impossible in my mind. So, you know, they're appealing to America and Britain. Like, America and Britain don't care about them, you know, so it, it's not looking good. Do you think we're likely to see a continuation of the spread of Chinese expansion next year? Yeah, of course. Like, there's no stopping them. Who's going to stop them? You know, like, America is incapacitated, you know, and I'm not saying, like, oh, yeah, let's get this country running into that country. But at the end of the day, someone is always going to bully everybody else in the world. That's just, unfortunately, the way things are. It's human nature. Um, and, you know, America's been a big superpower that's been bullying everybody. And now they've got Trump in charge. He's just like, yeah, like, I'm quite happy for all these kind of authoritarian states to do their thing now. So, you know, I think they're just like, they've been given a green light. You also spent a lot of time reporting this year from the war in eastern Ukraine. With the introduction of a new Ukrainian president, what impact do you think that's going to have on the war out there? Uh, well, it's interesting, actually, because Zelensky, the, the new president, has said he's going to end the war. Like, he's going to end it, I think, next year. Now, I don't know how he's going to do that. He's made some moves to make deals with Russia, and the Ukrainians are fuming about it because, you know, they've been fighting and dying on the front lines, you know, almost silently now because no one really pays any interest to it outside of Eastern Europe. So, you know, I, I don't, don't know how he's going to manage it. I think it's going to carry on and on, you know. If they do reach some sort of peace, do you think it will be a Latvian-style peace where they cede territory over to Russia or closer to something like Moldova or Georgia where the Russians set up a frozen conflict, breakaway republic situation? Yeah, it's, it's going to be more like that, you know. It's, it's the same with, like, you know, Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and it's going to be more like that, I think. It's going to be, like, weekly shelling, maybe one shell, maybe a few firing, you know, here and there. So technically it's still a war. But, yeah, it's like you said, it's going to be like that. But I think it's going to take a while to get like that because actually, you know, there's a lot of fighting going on still. You don't hear about it. But, you know, I spoke to someone literally two days ago who's on the front there, a soldier. And he was like, yeah, we just, we literally, they've been told you're not allowed to fire back unless you think your life is in risk. So unless the shell lands within a certain meter of where they are, they just have to sit there and wait. You know, it's incredibly frustrating for them. The EU is currently dealing with a large number of its governments moving towards high degrees of authoritarianism, mainly in places like Poland, Hungary, and to a lesser extent, Italy. How do you think the EU will respond to this? I don't think the EU really stands for anything particularly. You know, it's a nice idea, but they don't really have any morals. You know, I, I just did a podcast episode where the EU is um, knowingly assisting uh, basically uh, um, brutal, brutal punishment and abuse of migrants in Libya. And the EU assists in that and helps it happen just so they don't get too many migrants on their shores. You know, I don't really think the EU stands for much at all. Basically, the EU is like, if you're on our side, you can do what you want. Just don't be on Russia's side. I think NATO's like that as well. You know, I don't think it means anything about, you know, they'll have they'll happily have a, a brutal dictatorship in the EU. So long as it doesn't try and mess about with its borders or commit too many war crimes. It reminds me a lot of an old famous Franklin Roosevelt quote, which is, yes, he's a bastard but he's our bastard. 
Exactly, exactly. And that is awful because when you think about that, that means everybody living under that bastard is completely f basically, you know what I mean? Like, and it's, it, no one's coming to help them um, and it's disgusting. So really the only way they can do it is themselves. But if the EU or NATO, one of these powers decides that, well, yeah, they're good people fighting for their freedom, but it's not going to benefit us. They'll crush them, you know, and it's just, they just, it's just business. It's business as usual. The French also have elections coming up this year. Uh, do you think this might be the start of the downfall for President Emmanuel Macron? And do you think we might see the return of Marine Le Pen? Uh, I hope it's not Le Pen, but Macron, I think, is finished just because of his, his approval ratings are in the ground and the Yellow Vest protest is still going on a year later. Like, it's outrageous. If Le Pen gets in, then it's game mm. over. I think that's, you know, I mean, she's literally an open fascist. You know, even though she says she's not, she's openly a fascist. And that's a huge issue. But the French people are really pissed off with Macron. You know, so maybe they'll try the other way next time. With our news becoming more and more polarised and left-wing movements being swept aside, what do you think next year holds for left-wing politics? Luckily, there are some really good, like, movements. Like, uh, New York is a very good workers' union. You know, like, genuine working-class people who don't care about all of that nonsense online, probably don't even have Twitter accounts. And they're actually quite strong, but unfortunately, you don't see them as much, you know? Like a lot of the Bernie crowd are very good, you know, uh, actually recognizing what's important. Um, but again, you just don't see it. It's ampl everything else is amplified around it, you know. What's drama? What's dramatic? And that's all the nonsense is dramatic on the left and right. And what is important is actually not that interesting. It takes a long time to build workers' unions and it takes a, a lot of boring work to try and get wages higher. And that doesn't capture the attention, you know. And unfortunately, it's, you know, it really is the time of the spectacle right now. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been charged with corruption and bribery and is now looking like he might send the country back to the polls as well because he hasn't been able to form a coalition in the Knesset. Do you think this might be the end for Benji or do you think he'll be able to wriggle his way out of this one as well? <laughs> I think he's just going to win again, man. Like, uh, they just love a strong man, you know, and he's making all these kind of racist. He talks about, like, the, the you know, the way he talks about Palestinians is, is making a real wave in Israel. A lot of people like it. You know, it's disgusting. So... He's going to win again, I think. There's, the, the corruption charges mean nothing, you know, like, he has no, he, there's no obligation legally for him to step down. Nothing's going to happen to him. The investigation's probably going to go on for years. He's going to be fine, I think. So let's move to the Americas now with Venezuela. The country is in deep crisis at the moment with people starving and the economy teetering on the edge of collapse. So what do you think 2020 holds for Venezuela? I think it's one of them ones where, like, it's just kind of, again, nothing means anything anymore. It's almost like... I don't know, man. He just, you know, he's kind of running his little dictatorship. And I think if he keeps it within the borders and doesn't do too much badness, it will just carry on, you know? Like, I mean, he's doing bad anyway. Like, people are starving and stuff. I mean, I don't think if he, I think if he doesn't rebel, rabble rouse anymore, maybe there'll be another assassination attempt on him and they, it might work. But I don't know, man. I think it's just going to carry on, you know? Like, the thing that people don't realize, like, Guaido, like, the opposition, he's not a great guy, <laughs> you know? Like, it's not like there's this amazing guy and then Maduro, this absolute idiot, which, you know, a lot of hardline communists will say he's a good guy when he's obviously not. But, um, you know, like it, it, Guaido isn't he's not the guy that people think he is, actually, you know. So I think there needs to be a more powerful opposition than him. Well, let's turn towards the US now with the 2020 election and let's start with the Democrats. So who do you think will get the Democratic nomination? I mean, it's going to be Biden, isn't it? <laughs> like, it seems to be like, I don't know, man. He's a joke. I mean, I read something. Apparently, Warren's in free fall. You know, I can't stand her, but Biden's even worse, I think. They've learned nothing. Democrats have learned absolutely nothing. I don't know, man. I don't know. Well, then who would you like to see get the nomination? Bernie. I, the only one I like, out of, I, you know, again, I don't like any politicians. I'm not a government guy as such. But, uh, you know, if I was in America, I'd be, I personally would vote Bernie. I think he's pretty good, you know. I don't think it's realistic. I don't think his vision of what he wants America to be would ever work in America. Culturally, they're just, they're not, it doesn't, it doesn't work. But it's nice. I think it's a nice idea. I think he's a good guy. You know, he seems genuine. Um, he seems to care about the right things, in my opinion, you know. So for the big question, who do you think wins the 2020 presidential election? Trump. He's going to win. He's going to win everything, <laughs> of course. I don't know, man. I think it might be closer, but I think he's going to win, man. Like, it's just, if you, I've been studying the, like, the kind of QAnon movement and some of that for a while. Not that they're the majority, but the, the cult around him is just unreal. 
And lastly, what do you think will be the biggest news story for 2020? Man, that's a great question. I mean, I mean, who knows? But um, my hope, again, is to go back to what I said at the start. My hope is that there's some light is shed on the uh, Epstein thing and, like, someone actually goes into it, you know, like, and it actually makes waves, but I doubt it. Like, he's dead now, so, you know. Um, but what would be the big story? I, I think there's going to be a big war. I think there's going to be a serious war. I don't know where, but I think, I think it's coming, you know, and I think that will... I don't mean, like... Syria gets worse. I mean, like a new one. You know what I mean? Maybe in Eastern Europe. We'll see. Hopefully not, but we'll see. 2020 is likely to be a year that will be spoken about in history with confusion and derision for decades to come. Something we will all live through, but will struggle to fully explain to our children. There seems to be a slew of conflicts on the horizon. Whilst we already have fighting in places like Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Sudan, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and many more. So, to get a better idea about these conflicts, we turn back to an old friend of the show, who has not only seen these conflicts firsthand, but also might hold the answers to them. So, we turn to our next guest. Part 3. The Return of the Warlords I, I think uh, perhaps my, my bias is, is slanted uh, as an American, but I think Trump's disruptive impact on the globe uh, was the biggest story. Uh, he's Time Magazine Man of the Year, in my opinion. Brian Glenn Williams is one of the top advisors for the CIA and NSA, specializing in Afghanistan and the Middle East. He's also one of the best-selling authors on the subject and has worked with various US administrations. He joins us today. So that's had a tremendous uh, disruptive impact uh, here in America. And uh, certainly uh, Trump has had a disruptive of impact across the globe uh, uh, on many levels. So let's start with Ukraine. This year saw comedian Vladimir Zelensky take the presidency of the country, and he has said that he will bring an end to the war with Russia in the East within the year. Uh, do you think he'll be able to achieve this in 2020? Uh, Zelensky's hand has been weakened uh, tremendously uh, by uh, Trump. You know, Trump uh, has, has brought Ukraine into domestic politics. Uh, he's denied these weapons that they needed. They still have not received all of the $400 million uh, uh, of weapons that were slated to be given to them and funds for, for arms slated by Congress. Uh, so they're still having to see those weapons. Uh, and he now knows that he's a pawn in Russian, uh, I mean, American domestic elections, as does Putin. And Putin knows that, that Trump has no real uh, interest in Ukraine. Uh, during these uh, impeachment hearings, we heard over and over again, uh, these professionals come in, like Fiona Hill, and state in no simple terms uh, that they heard and got the signal from the top that Ukraine's not important to, to Trump. It's uh, Biden that was important. So this has really weakened Zelensky's hand vis-a-vis -vis negotiations with Russia. But I think he will, he will fulfill his promise. I think he wants to de-escalate uh, the war uh, in, in Donetsk and, and the tensions over the, the, the 2014 annexation of the Crimea. And I think there's uh, you know, interest on both sides uh, to de-escalate this conflict, which has cost both sides so much and the sort of normalized relationships between uh, these two great Slavic neighbors. So 2020 is tipped to have the price of oil fall again, which often creates further strain on Russia with the sanctions still in place. Uh, do you think we're likely to see further destabilization of the Russian Federation next year? We, we've seen protests in, in 2019 uh, rising up against Putin. Uh, it, it, young people in particular are, don't like his iron hand. Uh, and certainly anything that involves oil prices will hurt the whole economy of Russia. You know, it, it's so dependent on oil. And certainly the, the sanctions that have been enacted against Russia uh, by the European Union uh, and America to, to punish it for its actions in Donetsk and Crimea will continue to take their, their hold uh, on the country, despite the fact that, that Trump once overturned them on the American side. Uh, so I think his hand is hurt to a degree, but don't forget, he still has an iron hand, an iron rule over uh, Russia, and he'll survive. This year, we also saw Turkey brutally move into the Kurdish one territories in northern Syria, uh, killing many people who fought with us against ISIS. Uh, what do you think Turkey's next move in the region might be? Well, you know, uh, uh, as we saw, there's this catastrophe uh, in uh, this area in northern Syria called the North Syrian Democratic Federation. Uh, there we saw that these, these dem democratic, pro-women's rights, uh, environmentalist uh, uh, pro-American uh, Syrian Kurds carved out a, a, a stable area called Rojava. 
Uh, and this was a, a beacon of hope uh, for many people in the Middle East. You know, this is what the, the neocons invaded the Middle East for in the first place, in many ways, uh, back in 2003, to create grassroots democracies. And we saw that with his precipitous uh, decision to withdraw uh, the 1,000 force multiplier troops, uh, American troops, from this region uh, in October 6th, after this conversation with Erdogan, uh, the Turkish leader, that has tremendously destabilized that, that region. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the Turks did abhorrent things. Uh, they invaded uh, three days later and, and uh, have cleansed cities of uh, ethnic Kurds from their ancestral homeland. Uh, they brought in these jihadist proxy warriors, and I see them continuing this process in 2020. You know, um, uh, they've carved out a zone already, a so-called safe zone, which is ironic, uh, uh, in this operation that's misnamed called Operation uh, Peace Spring. And they'll continue to try ethnically cleansing and pushing out Kurds from their ancestral homelands and trying to put in these millions of more conservative Arabs, refugees, Arab refugees from Syria who are living in Turkey. They will try pushing these Arabs into these Kurdish lands to create a Arab zone as part of Erdogan's policy of, of pushing Kurds away from his border. Uh, the only thing stopping this process at this moment is not the Americans who have essentially ceded all of their influence and clout in Syria uh, with Trump's withdrawal order. The only thing stopping this process of ethnic cleansing, which the Turks already did in Northwestern Syria when they brutally cleansed uh, the province of Afrin, previously the most Kurdish area in all of Syria, uh, when they invaded it last year and cleansed it. The only thing stopping them from doing that in this larger area in Northeastern Syria, ironically enough, are the Russians. Uh, when the Americans pulled out, the Russians triumphantly marched into our bases and filmed themselves, you know, uh, mocking us and, and seizing our, our, our supplies and our bases. Now these very same Russians uh, who we're jostling for power with in Syria are the, the power brokers. And Putin is now the only force that can stop the Turkish president Erdogan from fulfilling his promise to cleanse all these Kurds and then burn their villages and force out these democratic, pro-American, pro-women's rights Kurds and replace them with more conservative Arabs. So. Uh, Trump has proclaimed that he created a ceasefire, a quote-unquote gift to civilization. Uh, all this ceasefire did uh, in November of 2019, all it did was freeze Turkish conquest. Uh, and Turkey will try pushing farther into this area to cleanse these uh, pro-American Kurds who've been abandoned by Trump. And it, my theory is that this uh, ad hoc alliance between the Russians and Kurds will stop Erdogan from pushing as far as he wants to. And uh, I think his, his uh, invasion is sort of limited now due to the fact that Russian troops are now in there working with the Kurds to prevent Turks from killing more Kurds. We're heading across the border now into Iraq, uh, where we're seeing huge protests against the current government. Do you think that's likely to fizzle out or escalate in 2020? No, that will definitely continue. You know, the Iranians, uh, ironically enough, are the ones who, who gained the most uh, in Iraq by the neocon 2003 invasion. You know, I, I call that invasion Operation Iranian Empowerment. Or Operation Shiite Empowerment. So we go in and we knock out Saddam Hussein, uh, who is a Sunni socialist Baathist, and he's a firewall against both uh, Iranian uh, aggression and jihadist aggression. Aggression. So we knock out Saddam Hussein and destroy this bulwark against Iranian influence in Iraq, counterintuitively. And in the law of unintended consequences, of course, the Ayatollahs in Iran come in and influence and take control of most of the country. Uh, and this, of course, infuriated many Sunni Arabs and also many Shia Arabs. Because don't forget, Iranians aren't Arabs. There's that deep hatred between Iranians and Arabs that goes back centuries. Uh, and this has caused tremendous uh, uh, unrest uh, uh, in Iraq as people see Iranian influence growing and growing and believe that their own leaders are controlled uh, by the Ayatollahs, by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. So we see these protests uh, in September, October with hundreds killed. Uh, and I think that will continue. Uh, now, of course, uh, the, the Iraqi Prime Minister uh, resigned uh, just a couple weeks ago, and that, to a degree, has mollified the protesters, but there's still tremendous uh, Iranian influence in the country, as we've seen by these recently leaked documents. And this has infuriated uh, Iraqis who rightly don't want to see their country be a puppet of the Ayatollahs uh, in Iran. So th that will definitely continue into 2020. Well, staying on Iran now, this year saw escalation in the Persian Gulf between Iran and Saudi Arabia, even having ships captured and oil fields attacked with drones. Is there an end in sight for this conflict, or are we likely to see this get even nastier over next year? You know, 
the maximum pressure uh, project uh, launched by uh, uh, Trump under the you know, impact of, of uh, Bolton uh, has created tremendous unrest in Iran. You know, uh, uh, they just increased the, the prices of gas to compensate for the fact that the economy is suffering uh, from the renewal of these sanctions that the Trump administration put on the country uh, after yanking us and yanking the Americans out of this uh, uh, nuclear agreement that was working, by the way. Uh, uh, we punished them for following the agreements, by the way. So it, it was working beautifully. Uh, so the European Union does not want to see these the, this, uh, sanctions put on the country, but America has, has put them on place uh, and in place, and it is hurting the Iranians. And Iranians are being boxed in an economy is being uh, crushed in many levels. And they're responding, as you mentioned, by uh, 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 putting uh, explosives on ships in the, in the Persian Gulf, uh, attacking Persian ships. And we saw in the summer, they launched this unprecedented cruise missile and drone strike on Saudi Arabia's largest oil facility, designed to punish America and its allies for putting all this pressure on it. Amazingly enough, Trump, uh, the man who claims to talk about fire and fury, and making America strong again, did absolutely nothing when the Iranians uh, attacked an American ally and did devastating impact uh, on this attack on their oil fuel uh, field. And, they, and when the Iranians shot down a drone, he also did nothing. So I think Iran sees this as a sign of weakness on the part of Trump. Well, now let's turn to America's biggest ally in the region, Israel. Uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been charged with corruption and bribery and looks like he may fail to form a majority government in the Knesset. Uh, what do you think 2020 has in store for the Israeli PM? Yeah, well, I, I think well, Benny Gantz won the last election, essentially. I think the, the, the wind behind Benny Gantz is sales now. I, I think next year we'll see uh, uh, Netanyahu fail, fail to create a coalition. And I think Benny Gantz uh, will seize control. And these long overdue corruption charges and bribery charges uh, against Netanyahu, if a bribery uh, TV channel, so to, to, uh, show favorite, cover, favorite coverage towards him, etc. Accepting gifts. These charges that, that seem almost indisputable uh, that have been haunting him uh, for years now will finally catch up with him and I think he'll, he'll finally confront the charges that, that he's avoided as Prime Minister. We're also starting to see the first signs of weakness in the Chinese economy, with many of their overseas investments performing poorly, a lot of debt being consolidated, and the central government buying up a lot of smaller debt-ridden Chinese banks. Uh, do you think this may be early symptoms of something much darker for the Chinese economy? Yes, and a lot of it is dependent on these tariff wars uh, with Trump. It has hurt the Chinese economy as well as it has hurt the American economy. It's destabilized the entire global system. Uh, Trump's wars with uh, China, you know, the two world's largest economies are at war. Uh, and that certainly uh, makes China cautious. You know, Trump came out belatedly after a lot of pressure from Lindsey Graham and other Republicans to uh, you know, sanction uh, uh, China, Beijing, for its crackdown in Hong Kong. And, and they stopped U.S. Uh, ships from coming into Hong Kong to, to port. Uh, and they're furious at this interference in their domestic issues. But they can only go so far because it's all, the most important thing is a trade war. I don't want to rock that boat. So I think the economy is, is fragile and it all depends on, on what Trump does. You know, Trump has said he won't uh, uh, solve this problem until 2020. And how is China responding to this militarily? They're still building these islands, you know, Mischief Reef over there uh, in the uh, uh, South China Sea. They're still building these artificial islands in, in the Spratly Islands, these bases that they're uh, building that would threaten uh, our allies, uh, South Korea and Japan. As you mentioned, they, they now have these bases uh, uh, in places like Djibouti and also tremendous growing influence in places like Afghanistan, economic interests, uh, and in Africa. Uh, so China's influence is on the rise. Uh, much to the, to the concern uh, of, of the Japanese uh, and the uh, uh, South Koreans. Uh, Trump has not really focused on that uh, in his rhetoric, which seems to be more focused on the trade wars. Uh, but certainly it's concerned uh, that the Pacific Fleet, the U.S. Pacific Fleet, is worried about. And it is one of the, I think, the, the pivot to the East, uh, the, the pivot to the Pacific, which began under uh, Obama, will continue in 2020. And what about the big Chinese domestic issue, Hong Kong? What do you think the future of these protests are? You know, I, I don't think Beijing expected such a vociferous reaction uh, as they tried stripping away a lot of the special rights and prerogatives uh, of Hong Kong. But these protesters have shown tremendous tenacity. Uh, and there's recent elections, local elections, uh, two weeks ago. And in those elections, pro-independence candidates seem to win across the board. 
So this speaks to, to no breaking of, of the fighting spirit of people of Hong Kong uh, in the face of this repression. Uh, so I think you'll continue to see tension and stress. You know, I don't think you'll see a uh, Tiananmen Square style crackdown because that would, that would lead to a tremendous devastating impact uh, economically for China in sanctions. Uh, but they'll continue to try stripping this economy, uh, autonomy uh, from Hong Kong and the protesters will continue this uh, unbroken uh, spirit of defiance in the, force of, uh, in the face of uh, Hong Kong's attempts to break the resistance and uh, take away a special autonomous uh, privileges. Moving across the Pacific now to Venezuela, where this year we saw a US-backed opposition attempt to overthrow the government there. But ultimately, it didn't have the support for the military and they were unsuccessful. Do you think opposition leader Juan Guaido is likely to make another push for the presidency in 2020? No, I, I think Guaido had his chance. He had one chance, and as you mentioned, uh, uh, the officer corps in the Venezuelan government did not come over to his side. Uh, he's lucky to have gotten out there alive, to be honest. Uh, so I think that was the one chance he had, and the CIA had, and, and Trump had um, to overthrow Maduro, uh, and he failed in it. So I think I don't think you'll see that happen again in 2020. Well, now to the big one, the U.S. 2020 election. What do you think will be the likely outcome? Thus far, Joe Biden has maintained his lead. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is in second place, and, and Buttigieg is coming up in third place. Uh, but it, the Democrats seem to, to rally around the concept uh, of Joe Biden being the guy who can defeat Trump. So he, his support has been pretty much unwavering uh, for the last four months. Now that could change in what we call the caucuses, these uh, debates that take place in the fall. And he could uh, stumble or make a gaffe. Uh, Elizabeth Warren could um, uh, come to the fore or Buttigieg. Those seem to be the, the three main candidates. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think Biden will probably weather the storm uh, because older white voters uh, who are a strong voting bloc uh, seem to support him and young voters who do want something more, more radical, something like uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, see Biden as better placed to defeat the ultimate enemy that is Trump. So this seems to be keeping him afloat. And uh, should there be an uh, election with him as a candidate, uh, polls show that he, in, in almost every poll, he defeats Trump in national elections. 70% uh, of Americans in a recent poll came out and said that what Trump did, you know, vis-a-vis -vis withholding these weapons for the Ukrainians to get them to manufacture dirt on uh, uh, Biden was wrong. And even Fox News, a conservative pro-Trump news outlet, uh, recorded two, months, two weeks ago that 50% of Americans now believe that Trump should be impeached and removed from office. So the movement seems to be going against Trump. Uh, Trump's popularity rating maxed out at about 44%. Compare that to, say, uh, Bush Sr., who was a moderate and a unifier, whose numbers, his polling numbers reached 90%. You know, more than double Trump's percentage rate. So Trump has solidified his party. 90% of Republicans uh, stand with him, according to polls, but he's done nothing at outreach. Uh, on the contrary, he's really divided the country with his, his coarsening of the rhetoric. Uh, his, 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 uh, the, the Mueller investigation didn't prove that he uh, collaborated with Russia, but it didn't exonerate him either. Uh, so it, it was a whitewash. Uh, and I think um, in many ways, the hearings, the impeachment hearings will impact Americans uh, in 2020. Uh, and it will, I think, uh, if Biden it goes against Trump, according to polls, every poll seems to show that he'll win even in, in uh, battleground states like uh, Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or Ohio. Uh, so I think this impeachment hearing will stick to him in ways the Mueller report didn't stick to him. And uh, I, I think, you know, the, the, the Republicans are behind him. But the undecideds are increasingly turning against him. And should there be a general election with Biden against Trump, uh, despite the Electoral College uh, disadvantage to the Democrats, Biden will probably win. And my last question, what do you think the biggest story of 2020 is likely to be? You, you might be surprised that one of the big stories will be a humanitarian crisis in northwestern Syria. You know, you have this the last rebel stronghold in the country with millions of refugees uh, living in this zone. Uh, a sort of safe zone uh, controlled by uh, an alliance of Sunni rebels who are opposed to the Assad regime. This safe zone could collapse in the next year as the Assad regime uh, garners more strength and moves into the north and Putin continues supports it. And um, you might see a humanitarian issue there. You might also see 
uh, a, a global financial crisis. You know, Trump's impact on the globe and its economy is so disruptive. You know, he calls himself the great disruptor. Uh, you could see another financial crisis. You know, it, it, it is really on the edge right now. Uh, so that could be another big story uh, of the year. Another big story could be Trump loses the election and his followers refuse to accept it. And he calls, you know, he's called for a civil war uh, should he lose the election. So if he should lose the election, don't be surprised if you have a tremendous uh, cleavage in America, uh, a refusal by Trump to uh, honor the election results, and, and a, a outpouring of fury on the part of Memmi and his party who won't accept a legitimate uh, election result that shows that their candidate lost. They say hindsight is twenty twenty, but I think this particular year may be harder than usual to predict. We are likely to see escalating fighting in Iran, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Turkey, and with each one of those having the capacity to drag in the major powers. We're likely to see China continue to expand across the globe, whilst the West is distracted with internal political instabilities. Or whilst China desperately tries to contain their own problems in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Europe has a number of key elections as well, and if the polls are to be believed, we will see nothing but a worsening of the current situation, threatening the very heart of the European project. And all of this is eclipsed by the US and their toxic election coming up. History buffs might begin to start to see a lot of the same dominoes lining up that brought the world crashing down in the early stages of the 20th century. We are almost certain the dominoes will fall sometime soon. And will we have the capacity to pick up the pieces from what remains? Thank you so much for tuning into the program. This has been a bit of a different style of episode for us here at The Red Line, but we had a lot of fun making it. This show has only been around for a few months now, but we are already blown away with some of the feedback and support we have been receiving. We never thought when we started this show that we would be talking with such an amazing range of guests. We honestly cannot thank anyone enough who's come on the show over the last few months. I'm currently sitting in Moscow, and we have some amazing stories coming up over the next few weeks, so please stay tuned. A huge thank you to the guests for this episode as well. If you want to hear more from Andrew, you can check out his amazing work. His book, Rational Choice, is particularly good. Jake Hanrahan's show, Popular Front, is also absolutely amazing. I've been an avid listener for years now, and it meant a huge amount to have him on the program. Brian is a great friend of the show and a man who lives right in the halls of power. We are so thrilled to have him on after his great work on our Afghanistan episode. Once again, if you haven't already, go check out his book, The Last Warlord, The Life and Legend of Dostum. It's an amazing read from cover to cover about the man who swung the entire Afghanistani war. If you want to support this show, you can donate to our Patreon, or you can follow us on most socials at The Red Line Pod, or you can follow myself on Twitter at Mike Hilliard Oz. Thank you so much for listening in, and we look forward to another even bigger year in 2020. But for now, wherever you're sitting in the world, Happy New Year.